For context, this interview was recorded in June of 2020 amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We all want a business like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Businesses where once a customer engages with them, it becomes automatic and part of their lifestyle from then on. But how do you build that forever transaction? Robbie Kelman Baxter has been studying subscription and membership models for nearly 20 years. And in this podcast, she uncovers the secrets and strategies of the membership economy. Join us for subscription stories, true tales from the trenches. Welcome to the show. This is Robbie Kelman Baxter. Today, we're talking about subscriptions with Greg Pichota, researcher in residence for the International News Media Association. We'll talk about best practices in digital transformation and how subscription maturity and approach varies by region. Data is everything. If there's you know, one person you should hire first is your head of analytics. You need to understand your customers before you try selling to them. We're also going to talk about prioritization of goals when you're trying to do multiple things, going from print to digital, going from third-party distribution to direct, and going from ad-supported to reader-based revenue, all at the same time. Since we're recording in June of 2020, we're also going to talk about how to manage a news business in times of great change. Welcome to the show, Greg. Welcome. <laughs> First of all, where are you taking this call? Uh, where, where are we reaching you right now? I'm based in Oxford, England. So we are in a lockdown. Uh, the shops are still not open. Uh, the kids have just started to go back to school. The first class, the first, the sixth, the sixth graders have started to come back to school. But basically, we are still suffering from the pandemic. Still in the, in the heart of the pandemic. And how did you come to live in Oxford? Uh, for, for many listeners, that seems like a, an idyllic and kind of magical place. Yeah, so I'm originally Polish. So I grew up in Poland and I've been a, a journalist and an editor and a news executive in Poland for more than 20 years. Uh, and I, a few years back, together with my wife, we decided to change our lives. And she left her job as a head of research for Citibank in Poland. And I left my job as a news editor of the biggest newspaper in Poland. And we went to the United States to study. Actually, I got a fellowship at Harvard University. And then we spent a year there in Cambridge in Massachusetts. We actually stayed longer because I got a job at Harvard Business School to study how uh, technology companies enter other markets and disrupt them and take over customers from incumbents. And after the stint at the Harvard University, I got a job at Oxford. So I, we moved to England, and here is where we are now. Oh, interesting. That's, that's quite a journey. And what was it um, that, that got you back onto the research side? I know that one of your last jobs uh, at the news organization was in innovation. Was that the springboard that uh, had you kind of seeking out these fellowships and looking for this more... Uh, intellectual research, pure research-based kind of work? I think, you know, I was very much interested in digital disruption. Being an editor of a, in a newspaper basically meant that I was dealing personally with digital disruption and transformation for most of my professional life. So I wanted to understand what uh, newspapers or news sites are doing right and what they are doing differently than maybe organizations in other places. And actually, the university opened my eyes that, you know, there are many industries who are digitally uh, transformed or digitally disrupted. And actually, you can learn uh, a lot by studying a different industry. So, for example, many news sites are facing a struggle how to compete with Facebook. That is, you know, uh, the most popular newspaper in the world in practice. And by the way, one of the biggest advertising-based uh, uh, media houses out, out, out there. But the competition between publishers and Facebook, that is like both friendly collaboration and sort of enemy kind of battle, is very similar to the experience, for example, of retailers who uh, compete with Amazon. So they, they you know, on one hand, 
if they go to Amazon and they start selling through Amazon, they could increase their sales. On the other hand, they somewhat lose direct relationship with customers. So actually, you can learn starting across the industries. This is what I was. The, this is what I found fascinating. I also found the academic academics work pretty similar to journalism. You know, maybe you need to be more careful about the data that you study, and you know the uh, the process of academic work is uh, is uh, slightly more robust because it's slower. Basically, it's more robust than it is <laughs> at, at, at you know modern newsrooms. But still, it's very it's actually very similar, and I found it fascinating to be able to learn how other industries are doing it and how we can actually translate those learnings into what news sites, news businesses can do to uh, fund journalism. So we're we're kind of two peas in a pod because uh, my focus in subscriptions has always been very broad um, in terms of working with industries across a wide range of uh, of areas as well as people in different functional areas and organizations at different stages in maturity. And it's always so interesting, I think, to look for patterns uh, in one place and see how they can be applied or whether they can be applied in another. Uh, so it's interesting to hear you talk about your work um, and kind of the similarities between retail and news. If you think about veterans in industries, sometimes, you know, what you, what happens is that over years, you just attend your industry conferences. So you are exposed to, uh, of course, new ideas and new ways of doing things, but basically coming from the same industry. And sometimes, you know, it's like you feel like a, like one of these horses that basically cannot look around because it has these blinders, you know, yeah. <laughs> blinders on, on, on both sides because, you you know, you, you face your troubles. So you just focus on solutions to your, to, to your direct troubles. You don't look around that much. And actually, when you do, you realize that similar problems uh, are shared and similar business models are shared by many industries and subscription obviously is one of them and that actually digital this digital transformation is making uh, businesses more similar to each other because for example so many businesses are based on data so in a way if you are a retailer like cvs and you are i don't know an, an amazon basically collecting data about what people are buying and how it, you know what what kind of products should be promoted you know you you learn a lot for example about people's i don't know health and this can be a basis for a new business model so data becomes like something that is shared across industries and it makes you know very companies from different industries suddenly compete with each other you know if you if you've got in the retail for example you've got companies like asus in england that basically is a retailer uh, that sells clothes but they found that the way to, to sell clothes today is more about inspiring people. What kind of, what, what, what you know, to, to help them discover the needs. So they do it through content. So basically, Essence have, has become a sort of a, a lifestyle magazine publisher. They, they, do it, they do it in order. You can buy everything they, they show to you, but basically they try to inspire their customers. So how is it different from like a, a Vogue magazine and other other lifestyle magazines that basically were showcasing people's clothes and just trying them and 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 just trying to sell advertising for retailers like Asus in the past. Yeah. Actually, we see uh, digital transformation is fascinating because we see ve very different industries, uh, companies from many different industries suddenly competing for the same uh, for the same currencies like you know attention. Uh, like a direct relationship with somebody, you know, do you have the credit card number of somebody and so on. So uh, this is what makes it, this is what, what makes it very, uh, very interesting. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm glad that as a journalist or as a researcher, I can actually help news publishers to uh, find ways uh, to, 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 to grow their business despite all the, all the challenges. So what's your advice? Let's say for, you gave the example of, of Asus and Vogue. So when a company like Asus with deep resources um, and a direct relationship with the customer suddenly says, we want to start creating inspirational fashion content, very much like Vogue, um, what, is, what is Vogue to do? What, what, is, what would be the guidance there for, for organizations that are seeing a competitor come from a totally different space? Um, but as you said, competing for the same resources, the attention of the customer, the credit card the permission to present new offers? I think, you know, what, what happens is that basically the business model of publishing is challenged in that way. 
And I'm thinking that uh, one of the first questions I would ask myself is, who is your God? Who is your primary customer? And mm -hmm. I bet that in case of the Vogue, the primary customer who pays for Vogue to, to, be, to, to, be, to exist is actually an advertiser. Yeah. And this is what really makes important it point. Very, it, it, this is what makes it very challenging for them to actually respond to a disruption by Asus, uh, because yeah. Asus no longer needs them in a way, no, no longer needs the Vogue uh, in a way to, to, to reach individual uh, consumers and show them amazing new things you can you can have in your in your wardrobe. So this is this is what makes it challenging. And I think when we look at the business model of publishing, this is actually this is actually what is happening. So Traditionally, many news consumers and many magazine consumers were basically subsidized by advertisers. Uh, advertisers were primary customers of those media companies, and consumers were, of course, important because they, you know, they paid with their attention. Uh, but you know, most magazines were almost free. Most newspapers were almost free because they were mostly funded by ads. What is happening right now is that advertisers have many more options to advertise, to show their products. Some of the advertisers become media companies themselves. You know, the biggest sport newsroom in Europe is not run by any news organization. It is actually run by Red Bull from Austria. Yeah. That is just an energy drink producer. So, you know, some, some advertisers become basically media. So the media need to like redefine their role within the set of customers that they used to serve. Maybe readers cannot, can no longer be subsidized. That's why many publishers, uh, you know, make such a strong push to build uh, digital subscription businesses to make readers actually pay for the value they get. Uh, right. There is a, there is another another set of customers who are newsmakers who traditionally were, you know, newspapers were writing about what they do for free. But today you see the trend of native advertising or branded content where actually some newsmakers basically start paying for to create content that will cover whatever they uh, whatever whatever they would do. Uh, you've got another set of customers like uh, people who are, I don't know, buying cars or selling apartments. And this business is gone for newspapers, but in a way, it's, uh, I think it's reinventing itself into e-commerce. So you see now so-called content to commerce uh, kind of models. BuzzFeed is one of those publishers who follows this business model. Uh, but Dennis Publishing in United Kingdom is a former magazine publisher that made 40% of revenue last year from selling cars directly to consumers. How does that work? Can you explain the model? So they used to publish many hobbies magazines and among them very strong uh, motors magazines about cars, about motors, uh, motorcycles, about uh, lorries, whatever. Then when the internet came, of course, and, and these magazines were partly funded by readers who were buying the single copies yeah. or the, the advertisers. When the internet came, the company uh, wanted to uh, build a classified business, but they were, they were not first to the market, they were second. Basically, this, this market of classified advertising, car sales is basically a sort of a winner takes all market. So. You know, number one is taking 80% of the value and everybody else is fighting for the remaining 20. It wasn't, it wasn't good. So they thought, okay, so we need to make our ads better than on the market. And they thought, you know, we need to engage readers very well. We need to tell them a lot about products so we can basically lead them to the decision. And then we can sell not just eyeballs, not just attention of our readers, but basically an intent of a user to buy a car. So they started selling leads. But when they started selling leads, they, they, they realized one thing. If I can make somebody want to purchase a car through me, why should I be selling leads? I should be selling the car because the, because the margin <laughs> I can make on a car is much bigger than I can make on a lead. And then right, they realized they're doing the that, hard work. Yes. Of, they're doing the heavy lifting of finding the relationship and finding the lead. It's easy to close the deal once, once somebody decides they want the car. Exactly. But then they realized even more that basically car dealers are not making money on selling cars. Actually, cars are very discounted. You know, they have a very low margin. You make money with finance, you know, how to finance the sales. You make money with guarantees, with insurances. So now this company, you know, is first. They have all those media 
that gather attention of car seekers, then they can inform them about all different cars that they can choose from, and then they can take their intent into basically lead it to their website where they sell the car to the individual consumer, and they can sell the car, they can help them finance it, they can help them insure it, and this is where most of the profit actually comes from, not from the sales of the car, but from the from those financial services. And it's amazing, a magazine publisher who actually is a car dealer, you know, yeah. uh, this is not perhaps what yeah, what the founders wanted, but this is where they ended up by innovating with the business model. And it's really interesting because, you know, if I can break down what you've what you've said or sort of summarize it, um, you're talking about a couple of things. The first thing that you brought up, which I think is really important for people to understand, is that whatever business you're in, you have to know, you said who your God is, who is your real, your forever customer? Who is it that you're in business to serve? And in the case of publishing, which is what we're talking about today, you really have to decide, are you in the business of supporting the advertisers or the end readers? And um, what is the expectation that they have of you? And then you gave this excellent example of this car enthusiast magazine, who I would guess would say, you know, we're in the business of helping car lovers, uh, and you said motorcycles and trucks and everything else, get the most enjoyment and value out of their passion. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe when they started, the way that they did that was through um, through articles and pictures. And over time, it's been helping them understand which cars to buy. And then it was making that car purchase a reality for them. Um, it reminds me, actually, you know, you talked about analogous businesses and how important that is. One of my clients is Haggerty Insurance. Uh, and they're uh, the largest um, insurer of classic cars in the world. So, you know, if you have a, whatever, a 66 Mustang or a Barracuda or one of these cool old cars or even a you know, much older car, they provide you with insurance. They do, you know, pallet, you know, flatbed uh, pickup, roadside service. If you have a problem, they know all the, the, the mechanics who fix old cars and they've actually gone the other way. So they did car insurance and then they built a membership model around the ownership because they said once you own the car there's all these other things you want to do you want to meet other car people you want to uh drive your car on cool roads you want to uh repair your car you want to you know rebuild the engine and so they built a membership kind of the opposite they built the community and the content after they did the uh the insurance so yes. What, what is what is really what is really amazing is that you when you connect those two cases, you see that it's about bis being basically customer centric. You need to yeah. choose who is your god to because you need to focus. If you don't focus, you yeah. don't get uh, you don't get a breakthrough. So you, when you focus and you start to uh, really try to understand what's the job that these people have. Uh, what's what's what really they want to achieve and what's the job they are hiring products to do yeah like like yeah, a car like or a magazine yeah. then you can really then you can really build up on it because then you can imagine okay so what is actually what is actually the the, the end service that people want to uh, that people want to uh, people want to have and you know let me give you another example of a magazine publisher that went through a similar similar discovery to basically end up being somewhere else. So this is a company called Essential in the United Kingdom. Uh, they used to be known as a EMAP. Uh, you know, they started as a newspaper publisher like a hundred years ago, and then they switched into magazines. They were very active in the uh, magazines for different industries, like you know, Retail Week, uh, a magazine for nurses, a magazine for motorists, and so on. And at a certain point. They uh, sold most of the magazines. They just decided to focus on the business of FMCG retail. They still have a magazine, FM Retail Week, but it's no longer a magazine publisher because they, they started to ask questions. Okay, so what these guys who are running FMCG businesses and retail businesses really want, really need, they want to sell more. They want to understand their customers. They want to understand how the market works. So they want to have intelligence and they want to act on this intelligence. Uh, so the company started to use the relationship they had to basically build new services, dashboards about what's, what's selling currently on major 
online retailers? What kind of clothes? What's the what, what's the color? You know, what's the popular size? Whatever. You, you, so you get live intelligence about what's going in the shops. It's not actually journalism in a way. It's it's more like data service. But the, the process was asking the right questions. What my cons, cust, customer really needs? Did they really wanted to read articles about shops, or they wanted to sell more clothes in their shops? Right. Well, it's it's, uh, it's such an interesting point because a lot of businesses, especially we're talking in the world of publishing, a lot of these businesses have been around, as you said, for 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 t- for tens, if not hundreds, of years, and they not only do they have this mission of you know helping a particular group of professionals or a particular community, but also they build up a way of delivering that value. So, for example, they have journalists, and suddenly, you know, in the models you're talking about, instead of journalists, maybe they need market researchers or they need uh, technologists, right? You know, we, you and I, went on a tour a few years ago. Uh, at the Financial Times, and they had more technology people than journalists on their team. Um, that's a very different um, kind of, of of business, and I think for some organizations, they have kind of a crisis of identity. Um, you know, if if we don't need the same people and the same skills, are we still? Is it more important to keep the same employees and the same jobs, or is it more important to keep the same mission uh, and promise to the people we serve to our customers? I would say that you really go to the fundamentals. What's the purpose of a company? And, you know, Peter Drucker was always was writing that the purpose of the company is to create a customer, uh, create a customer, meaning basically solving the problem of a customer. Otherwise, there is no customer. So there is no money. There is no business. And I think this is uh, especially important when you try to build, uh, you know, the forever transaction. Because whatever deficiencies you, you might have, you know, they will come out over time. If you think about, you know, the, the newspaper business is about serving the needs of a, of a news consumer in, in her lifetime, basically. You know, this is the, this is the objective. We want to subscri- make somebody subscribe to the paper until she dies and even longer because we want to have a family package. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what the business is about. So we need to think about the core value that we deliver to those people. And the core value is not what you write, as we say, is that, that they read, yeah? So they, 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 they get the value, they define the value. They are, they are life choices, they are problems, like some people want to, you know, to be better informed. Some people interact with news sites because they want to get entertained. Some other people want to basically be able to speak to other people, interact with others, feel they belong to a group. Some others, you know, they don't want to learn about anything. They are just stuck in a in a subway during a rush hours, and they don't want to look at those faces around, all in masks. And they just, you know, turn on the mobile phone and they start reading news. So we, these are different customers, and these are different needs they have towards media. And we need to think how how are we serving those needs in such a way that they want to stay forever. Yeah. So we really need to deliver the value. We can't cheat it. So one of the challenges that we've seen in the news world, and I'm interested in your in your take on this, you know, we've talked about the kind of transformation around the customer. One of the big challenges, though, structurally is this move from ad revenue to subscription revenue and a change effectively in who the master is or who the uh, primary customer is. When I have talked to news organizations, you know, I've, I've often said, you know, it's really hard to do a good job if your customer is the advertiser and your customer is the reader. It's hard to find where those goals align. And I'm interested in your point of view with all of these organizations that are saying, well, we need the reader. We need the, we see that reader revenue. We see that subscriptions are the future for our industry. We know we have to get there, but we're dependent on the ad revenue right now. And we don't want to cannibalize that revenue. And yet, Do we balance our investments? What is your advice to organizations that understand they need to move to subscription, but are concerned about the cannibalization risk and leaving money on the table in the interim as they move from one model to the next? I think this is a very good question. Uh, Many, many publishers struggle with balancing the business models and, you know, balancing where we should invest, how quickly we can, uh, we can get there. Uh, can we afford to lose some businesses? And I think that increasingly it's becoming clear that 
actually advertising and subscription business models are very much connected. It seems that because of the what publishers have learned by building their subscription businesses, they are now reinventing what how advertising works and they build the, like the fundament for the future growth of advertising. Why is that? Because basically today's advertisers, they do not want to buy just ad impressions. They want to buy ad impressions to the right people at the right time. So they require targeting. They require sophistication from the media and they get it from Google today and from Facebook and from Amazon. And this is why these companies dominated digital advertising all over the world, except China, where, you know, three other Chinese guys basically dominated the advertising. So publishers now realize that thing, because they, uh, when they, when they focus on subscriptions, uh, the focus is basically on making people read more and the focus is on making them to register on the sites and log them in. Otherwise, you know, if you're not logged in, you cannot uh, get, for example, the premium content that you paid for. When, because people are logged in, basically they leave much more data, uh, like footprints in a way, about what they were doing on the website. So publishers collect data about their reading habits. Publishers have data about their I don't know, uh, they, are, they are transactions in the past. Uh, publishers ask them questions in surveys so they get information about other things, their plans, their intents, their lives, and so on. All this data uh, is today used mostly to sell, uh, to sell subscriptions, like to predict who is going to buy, who is going to churn. But actually, the same data, the same technologies can be used to build... Uh, advertising business based on first party data of publishers. And we are now seeing that the biggest publishers like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, I don't know, the News Corp uh, and the others, they are focused on translating these skills that they learned building a, a subscription business and uh, taking the data that they collect about their subscribers to actually be able to re reinvent advertising, you know, for, for, for the future. So I think actually that in a way, as of today, it's very difficult to, th to think that you will be successful in advertising in the long term if you don't build a successful subscription business. I'm sorry <laughs> to say it, but this is, this yeah. is how we are seeing it now. It's so important. This is such an important, um, important point for anybody who's building a subscription business right now about the, the kind of interconnectedness. And, and, you know, I think what Greg is talking about in terms of there needing to be a new way of advertising that is much more based on the the customer's goals and their need states. So another really important kernel here is to think about the role that subscription plays in your broader business model and be willing to refocus uh, your entire model around your kind of current market conditions. I would very much encourage people to think about subscriptions as something that can stabilize uh, the business model. So because it's forever revenue, because it's long term and you aim at having these relationships with customers long term, basically uh, it helps you to, you know, after after some time, you you can predict you know the revenue in the future. This is very important. You you can predict based on your churn rates, based on the uh, the, your, your pricing, you can predict the lifetime value of each customer. So I know how much money I will make next year. This is what makes subscription right. very good for to build a fundament of the business, to mm -hmm. be able to understand, you know, how to cover the most important costs in the business. Because, for mm -hmm. example, for publishers, this is what is stable, actually. Readership revenue is stable. Uh, the difference with advertising is advertising is cyclical. You know, it's going great when it's great, but when the economy is down, advertising is down the first. Like you right know, if, now, yeah. Yes, like, like right now. So this is why I think it's interesting to think about subscriptions as, uh, you know, what about the benefits of a subscription business model and predictability of revenue and stability of revenue is one of them. So I think it. It is even more important than just a profit driver for, 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 for some publishers. It helps you to do many things, like for Facebook, you know, because they know the lifetime value, they can better plan their marketing spend, the acquisition spend. Yeah. So why they are able to invest so much money in new movies? Because 
they spend not today's money in a way, not today's revenue. They spend future revenue. They know how much revenue they are going to make right. next year, and they are spending it today to outgrow everybody. This is what is the beauty of this business model. Yeah, the predictability of the cash flow is so is so important. Um, I wanna I wanna just finish by asking you what advice you have for uh, entrepreneurs and executives, maybe not in the news world, not in the publishing world. Um, but who are trying to build robust subscription businesses. Um, as someone who's been both um, an operator and a scholar in this field, what would be your advice for them? If there is one big thing that publishers learned over the past uh, more than 10 years of building subscription business models is that data is everything. If there is you know, one person you should hire first is your head of analytics. You need to understand your customers before you try selling to them because you need to uh, define the product that is the right. You need to find the delivery. You need to define the pricing. You need to, and then you need to track the performance to be able to improve on it. So data, I think data, data. this is the one thing that I would say. Great. And um, speed round. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions for you and I just want you to answer the first thing that comes to your head. And we'll go really quick. Um, what was the first subscription you ever remember subscribing to? Oh, gosh. It must have been probably a cable. Cable subscription. Ca cable <laughs> subscription, yes. And what is your favorite subscription today? My favorite subscription today, I think Zipcar. I don't have a car. I live in a medieval town, so there is no place to park. And I'm using Zipcar. So there are cars parked around. Uh, you know, in some places, and I can just use my mobile phone to book it, immediately open it, and ride somewhere. I just think it's amazing how you can use subscriptions <laughs> to, you know, to, to get a car. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, what would you say is your superpower? My superpower, I think, is uh, making very complex things sound simple, so people can better make decisions about them. This is, I think, is my power as an editor, and hopefully as an academic. And uh, what do your colleagues hate about working with you? And what do they love about working with you? Oh, I guess, you know, if I would talk about my former employees, I was running a newsroom of, I don't know, 500 people. Yeah? So uh, they hate it. I'm, I'm relentless. I'm a, I'm a workaholic. I'm always on. And if I, if I needed to learn something and improve was that I was always on. I was always asking and demanding. So... This is my so I so saw now so imagine basically a sort of a uh, a sort of a monster. So th this is this is who I was as a manager, and perhaps I can improve now working working very differently. And what do people love about working with you? I think because I'm focused on long term relationships. I I think I I help people improve and to discover you know they are superpowers. So I had you know I had very low. Um, how to say it not that many people wanted to leave uh, working with me and I'm very proud of it yeah that's it that's that's high praise <laughs> this was wonderful um, I certainly got some some great nuggets um, some takeaways and uh, I'm sure that the listeners did too this was uh, Greg Pichota thank you so much for joining us on subscription stories thank you very much it was a pleasure it was mine Thanks for listening, everyone. This has been Subscription Stories. Today, I was talking to Greg Pichota, researcher in residence at the International News Media Association. To hear more success stories of entrepreneurs creating their forever transaction in this new and exciting membership economy, subscribe to my podcast wherever you download your podcasts. Also, if you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and review. They mean so much. Thanks for listening and for your support. To learn more about the International News Media Association, go to inma.org. I'm Robbie Kelman-Baxter. Baxter.